Imagine a young adult book series that goes beyond the page, inviting readers to interact with its characters and story in the real world. In 2006, I walked into my local bookstore and got my very first taste of such experimental fiction when I stumbled upon this and found myself immediately intrigued. After all, it's not that often a book cover includes a random girl's phone number. Hey, this is Kathy and I can't come to the phone right now because cell phones can be traced and not always by the good guys. Emma, if this is you, I left my book under your porch. I think there's stuff buried there we haven't figured out yet. Leave a message at the beep. The Kathy's Book Trilogy, released in 06, 08, and 09 respectively, and attempted to turn the classic YA novel into an interactive multimedia experience. The book's characters had actual working phone numbers that you could call. Each entry in the series was packaged with a bag containing miscellaneous pieces of evidence that, when deciphered, would lead readers down a rabbit hole of different websites, government records, products, real-world locations, and and add a totally separate dimension to the book's sprawling mystery. This sort of quasi-alternate reality game approach to reading was totally unheard of for the time and broke new ground in the medium. Authors Jordan Weissman and Sean Stewart created something that might best be described as Twilight meets Lonely Girl 15. Each book is presented as the authentic diary of a teenage girl named Kathy who, after investigating the disappearance of her ex-boyfriend Victor, finds herself thrust into the middle of a centuries-old conflict between various immortals who are bent on world domination. The journals weren't your typical books. Each page contained scads of young Kathy's doodles and musings interwoven through the narrative, as well as the aforementioned supplemental documents that occasionally offered puzzles for readers to solve. This unique packaging was made possible thanks to a marketing tie-in with makeup brand CoverGirl, who heavily promoted the book in exchange for prominent product placement within the story. This arrangement sparked a brief firestorm in the reading world, with hundreds of irate parents writing angry letters protesting the decision to let a company already in hot water regarding unhealthy beauty standards advertise directly to young and impressionable girls through a previously sponsor-free medium. Perhaps in response, later paperback versions of the series removed all such product references. Lost in the ethical debates surrounding brand integration, was, of course, the original authorial intent, namely to create a character and a story as heavily integrated into the real world as possible. The books targeted young readers who were interested in a relatable female protagonist that seemed like a girl who might actually exist in the real world with her own cell phone, her own artistic aspirations, her own dysfunctional social life. As far as gimmicks go, it certainly caught the attention of said young readers who helped to propel the first book to the New York Times bestseller list, but how good was the series really? It's complicated. Hi, Sergeant Kowalski. This is Kathy Vickers, the girl that got kidnapped. My boyfriend disappeared, and then Carla got shot, and then there was... Sure, I'd like to report a lost book. I know, but this one has special things in it. Like phone numbers and ways to listen on private messages. It's not just a book. It's me. So at least in terms of interactivity, the first book is by far the runaway winner. Almost immediately after cracking open its pages, readers are encouraged to investigate real-world locations and to pick up their phones and call various characters. As Kathy records the details about her investigation, you are invited to cross-reference different bits of info with the various documents included in the evidence bag, birth and death certificates, newspaper clippings, photographs, stolen planner pages, and even restaurant takeout menus, there's plenty to comb through, and your hunt will often take you outside of the book and onto the World Wide Web and beyond. By page 42, you're attempting to hack into one of the characters' voicemails to see how they may or may not be implicated in certain events, and you already start to draw up theories as to what happened to Kathy's boyfriend. As a young reader, I remember being incredibly entertained by all of this, spreading each piece of evidence out on a table in my room 
like a 16-year-old Sherlock, poring over the clues. Now, however, as a mustache-toting adult who has lived through 17 further years of social media advancement, I can definitely see a lot of the shortcomings. For a book that is trying desperately to break into reality, the actual package itself struggles to nail a sense of realism. Some of the evidence, like the photographs, the shipping receipt, or the famous lipstick-imprinted diner napkin, these look and feel super authentic, but then you also get what are supposed to be like newspaper clippings, birth certificates, and private correspondences that are clearly just mock-ups printed on standard copy paper. Maybe they only had a budget to go big on a select few of the items. Similarly, the book's internal text, although written in the style of a teenage girl's journal, still elects to mostly use a standard typeface, which left me wondering just how much more immersive it all might have been had the publishers at Running Press actually been willing to go all the way and have the whole thing handwritten for ultra-realism. I guess I felt a bit of, like, tonal whiplash that a book trying so hard to not seem like a book still ends up falling back on these, like, safe sort of standards that end up breaking the fourth wall anyway. As far as the actual writing of the story goes, book one is probably the best. The plot is just your standard early aughts rebellious teenage girl stuff, but the characterization of Kathy feels quite authentic. I actually really liked how the character would retroactively go back and make amendments to her journal, some of which provided moments of levity and some of which foreshadowed deeper mysteries. Illustrator Kathy Brigg did a great job with the diary's doodles and scribbles, which added another layer to the story. It's definitely a short read at only 143 pages, but the time spent on all of those interactive elements kind of makes up the difference. Overall, book one offered an interesting first glimpse into the potential that a multimedia mixed reality novel type thing might offer. Unfortunately, the follow-up entries fail to really deliver on any of those promises. Hey there. Kathy can't come to the phone right now. She's about to come down with a bad case of poly. Clocking in at 216 pages, the second book, Kathy's Key, is a much more traditional read than the first. This is evident almost from the very first page. Rather than the first book's scattered musings and eclectic writing reminiscent of a teenage girl, this book is full of novel-like prose that attempts to convey a more cohesive story. It makes the book feel chunkier, sure, but in a weird way it sort of also loses a lot of its charm because, I mean, why is Kathy suddenly writing like an author. After solving the mystery of her missing boyfriend, the series now pivots to more of a heavy PG-13 action series, with a sprawling road trip, plenty of chases, fights, and classic teenage angst. Several new characters are introduced to the series, but if I can be completely honest, like, none of them were likable to me. And I really didn't enjoy the direction that they took with this new book. Without giving too much away in terms of spoilers, I just started getting really annoyed with Kathy as a character. She does nothing of actual importance, is always making situations in the story worse, and worst of all, almost every single male character at some point falls madly in love with her even though she spends, like, barely any time with any of them. It just does not make sense. Whatever, I don't want to go off on a tangent. I think the big problem is that while book one also had its fair share of narrative shortcomings, its unique interactive storytelling experiment was at least interesting enough to help you overlook them, but in book two, the interactive elements just feel just super tacked on. I was actually really disappointed. There are like a lot fewer items than there were in the first book, and a ton of them were just purely cosmetic drawings and sketches. There's maybe like one interactive puzzle in the entire evidence bag, and all of the material is now just clearly printed onto standard copy paper with no real effort to make any of it feel authentic. Even the stuff designed to look like old letters is just like only printed on one side. I don't know why they made that decision, it honestly makes all of this evidence feel super cheap. You do get this cool coin though, so that's neat. Really, book two's evidence bag just sort of feels like a collection of bonus extras. There are maybe a handful of websites, email addresses, a few phone numbers to call, but really that's just about it. Which is kind of a shame, honestly, because a lot of the characters are way more fleshed out in this entry of the book, and so you think that the writers would have, like, given readers an opportunity to interact with these characters more, but it's just 
not there. All in all, I walked away from book two feeling that the entire thing was just one big missed opportunity to improve upon elements introduced in the first entry, and as a result, Kathy's Key comes off feeling like a solid step backwards. But boy howdy, is it nothing compared to the utter disappointment that you will find in book three. And Kathy, if this is you, please, answer your phone. They're coming to kill you. Emma. And I really, I can't let that happen. Here they come. The last entry in the series, Kathy's Ring, honestly just feels like a last minute slap together afterthought. I really don't get why they didn't just tack this on to the end of the previous book. It almost feels like they were contractually obligated to make a trilogy, and so they took the original ending of book two and just like stretched it out with pointless filler to try and churn out another entry. I say that because the first act or so of the book is just one long glorified recap of the series. The second act is this super boring love triangle that makes absolutely no thematic sense. And then in the third act, they finally decide to go and take down the big baddie of the series. It is super short compared to the previous books. Basically, nothing happens for the overwhelming majority of it. The characters are all just sort of traveling around and reminiscing with each other in preparation for a little girl's birthday party that will act as the battleground for the climactic finale. I wasn't rooting for any of the characters I was just so bored by Kathy's big love triangle dilemma because she like didn't have any chemistry with either of the two dudes. Maybe it's just not my style of story. I didn't get it. But the biggest heartbreak comes from this book's interactive elements, which I put in air quotes because frankly, there aren't any. So the book promises another big bag of evidence and clues just like the previous entries, but when you open the package up, I'm not kidding you, it's just a poster and a little plastic ring. That's it. The poster does have a hidden clue on it, but once you put two and two together, you realize that it like totally spoils the ending of the book. If you open the package and you look at the evidence before you start the book, you're gonna know how it ends. Why? Honestly, at this point in the series, I was just reading it to try and like wrap up the plot. I don't know if the publisher decided that it would be more cost effective if they just dropped the interactive elements gimmick, but it just makes book three feel so cheap and underwhelming. Man, what a drag. So having now reread the books with an older pair of eyes, I can now see a lot of the issues that would arise from using this sort of experimental multimedia format. The most obvious, of course, is that when your book relies so heavily on online elements, you significantly lower the hypothetical shelf life. While many of the book's phone numbers actually surprisingly still work in the US, almost all of the websites have since closed down, meaning any readers that discover these books 20 years later will be met with error pages whenever they go online to search for clues. This is all entirely understandable. Nobody is out here expecting a publishing house to keep supporting an interactive website two decades after it was relevant. The makeup of the internet internet has changed a lot since the early aughts, so even if a publisher did, there is no guarantee that modern browsers would even be compatible with it. How we consume media online has certainly changed. YouTube itself was still in its infancy when Kathy's book was first published, and with the social media landscape changing so much so rapidly, it's of course unreasonable to expect something like a book to keep up. But the inclusion of interactive elements also presents other challenges, like what if a reader examines examines them at the wrong time. Often when reading through the Kathy trilogy, I would delve into a puzzle too early, and I would get spoiled, making the book's reveal much less impactful. And on the flip side, sometimes I would do a puzzle too late, realizing that its plot significance has already passed, making the act of solving that puzzle feel like a total waste of time. With a book like this, publishers also have to worry about logistical concerns. What if a reader gets a copy of the book that's missing important elements? Did they reckon that this was possible with Kathy's book, and thus decide that the internal text needed to always be able to stand on its own? If so, did this rob the evidence gimmick of some of its mystique? What if they had really gone all the way and made all of the supplemental items as aesthetically authentic as possible? Would it have made the experience more enjoyable, but at the same time, less likely to turn a profit? All in all, while the Kathy's Book books showed the potential that mixed reality literature has, to me, its execution remains overshadowed by what could have been. So if Kathy's Book, or a concept like it, were to be tried again today, 
what might it look like? Feel free to share your ideas in the comments below. This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. They can help you put together a beautiful website in no time. Start by choosing from one of their stunning templates and then use their new Fluid engine to customize it however you want. Use member areas to host exclusive video content. And if you've got something to sell, their online storefront makes it easy. Head to squarespace.com to start a free trial today. Give it a shot. Then when you're ready to launch your site in full, head over to squarespace.com slash Austin McConnell to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.